rolling. I always get so stressed when I'm in front of 30 people who are judging me. <laughs> Let alone YouTube. Okay, welcome to Angles and NASA where we learn things maths and science. And today we're going to look at the atomic models that we have progressed from over time. Um, so we started off way before Christ, 360 years BC or thereabouts, we're not entirely sure. This Greek guy, Democritus, proposed that maybe we can't continue to divide matter indefinitely. Maybe you'll reach a point where you can't cut any things anymore. And he called this fundamental piece that makes up all materials. He called it atom, so that's where we get out. It's actually Greek, so it's atomus, that's where we get the word atom from. And he reasoned that the different properties we get out of living mater uh, uh, materials around us, he reasoned that was because they had different shapes. So water is smooth and fluid because the atoms are round and smooth. Uh, things like salt is sharp in flavor, he thought maybe that's because the atoms are very sharp. And other things like that, well, uh, steel was uh, strong and durable because maybe they had hooks and loops that could link together very strong. Uh, next guy, about 2,000 years later, uh, picked up on this idea, John Dalton. He basically took upon some other information that matter is not created or destroyed. So a previous scientist, Antoine Lavoisier, did an experiment to find that out. No material is lost or created out of nowhere. So he tried to use the particle idea to explain why things, uh, 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 why they don't disappear. And he basically had these uh, atoms, they basically rearrange themselves in a chemical reaction. Uh, here I've got, you know, an oxygen molecule and two hydrogen molecules. They rearrange to make two water molecules. So you can see how all the particles are accounted for. He also had some other ideas, like they're all hard spheres, so they're no longer funny shapes. Uh, they form nice whole number ratios with each other to make these compounds as well. But the main thing is basically rearranging balls. Uh, he's also known as uh, proposing the billiard ball model. So this is the nickname. And that's because these uh, spheres are like a billiard ball. Next guy came along, J.J. Thompson. At this point in time, they discovered electrons are actually found within the atom. So now we have to say, well, they're not hard spheres, which don't have anything inside them. Now they are something with electrons inside them. But they're still neutral overall, so we try to account for the neutral charge by balancing out the positives and negatives. So he thought maybe they're like, like, a, like a plum pudding, I like to say chocolate muffin though, uh, where those chocolate chips are the electrons embedded inside the dough and the dough being positively charged. And that was his idea. The next guy we had, Ernest Rutherford, he said, oh, let's just blast some gold foil with some uh, radioactive material and see what happens. And so he fired alpha particles, which are basically the, very similar to a helium atom, just without electrons on it. So it's just a helium nucleus being flung into a very, very thin piece of gold foil, and he had a piece of film behind it to see where all those particles ended up. Most of them went straight through. So he said, okay, maybe atoms aren't like muffins after all. Maybe they're mostly empty space. And in fact, some of those alpha particles slammed into the gold foil and came straight back again. And so by deduction, he, re he sort of theorized that the middle must be very small because that means most of those things went straight through. He also theorized that the center of these atoms must be very dense, very hard, and very positively charged to repel those alpha particles back again. So he proposed there was a middle bit, and he called that middle bit the nucleus. So that's where we get the modern day nucleus from. Something in the middle. And obviously, uh, he didn't have any idea where the electrons were, so we said, mm, they're probably just somewhere on the outside. Uh, I think his model, and I have to check my notes, I think he proposed his model as called the planetary model. Let me just check that. Yes. Okay, so we, call, we nicknamed that the planetary model since it looks like we have like a central sun and all the planets are very much like the electrons orbiting somewhere on the outside. Just not sure where they are. Uh, and this one here is the plot body. Next we have Niels Bohr, which we were just talking about last lesson. Uh, roughly at this time, they were doing flame tests and basically any element, you stick it into a flame, it'll emit a really interesting color from the flame. So if you put in uh, copper sulfate or copper chl chloride, you'll get a nice beautiful green flame. If you put in strontium chloride into the flame, you'll get a beautiful red color. And the same is true for many other elements. In fact, every element has a very characteristic collection of colors. So if you can imagine, you mix a few colors together to make brown. You mix a few, mix a few colors to make you know, skin tone. Uh, the mixture is unique for every single element when they looked at them really closely. So he was trying to explain why are these colors, these fingerprint colors, which we call spectrum, 
okay, the spectrum of every single element. Why are they very defined colors of red, very defined colors of green, all blended together? Where do these defined stripes of color come from? He reckoned it's probably because electrons behave in very defined orbits, which he called energy levels. So if you give them energy in the flame, these electrons can pop out of their ground state. Ground state is when these electrons are as close as they can be to the middle, so standing on the ground. You give them energy, they can excite and pop up. So now they're in excited state from that flame. It could be fire, it could be a laser or anything else that gives things energy. And then in that temporary state, it'll then give away that uh, X, it'll give away the energy it used to have to come back down because that's more stable. That's where it would ra rather be. But to come back down, it has to give up that energy. And that's given away as a wavelength of light. So the bigger the jump, the more energy was given or, or, or taken up. So if it, if it jumped up really, really high, it's absorbed a lot of energy. And if it jumps down again in one big leap, it's going to be a high frequency, a high energy wave of light, which would be more like violet. If it had a very small jump, a very small amount of energy difference between those two levels of energy, therefore you get a low frequency, a low energy wave of light, would be more like red or infrared. And so he was trying to explain why hydrogen has its particular color pattern. It wasn't perfect. He was much less wrong than Ernest, uh, but uh, it still couldn't explain any other elements on the list. It worked for hydrogen, but none of the other elements on the periodic table could be explained perfectly uh, by this idea. Uh, further on, along in the story, we have James Chadwick. He didn't really propose a model per se. Um, oh, sorry, Niels Bohr probably has a model nickname. I just called it the Bohr model, but it's probably called something else. The Bohr model. <laughs> okay, so Bohr model, that's easy to remember, yeah? Okay. Uh, Chad Chadwick isn't really nominated to be a, 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 a propose, he didn't propose a new model idea. He just found that there's more stuff in the middle. He found that the nucleus, which we originally thought was just a single thing that's positive, he found that inside that nucleus there are neutral charges. The way he found that out is he was doing a very similar experiment to Ernest. Remember that gold foil? Yes. So he's bombarding, instead of gold, he chose beryllium. It's a much lighter element. And as he flung these alpha particles into it, he knocked out other particles on the other side of the, uh, of the film. And then he sort of did some tests to figure out, is it, is it, does it have a charge? Is it affected by magnets? And it is affected by nothing. So whatever came out the other side of beryllium had no effect on magnetism, no effect with electro, uh, electric field. So he said, okay, must be some neutral things in there that we've just knocked out. So maybe the middle has neutral things in it, which he called the neutrons. And so we just added it into the Bohr model. Now I think some people, maybe this class or the other class are asking, what's the next model? Is that the best model we have? Is that accurate? The answer is no. That's not the best we have. That's not the most accurate. The next thing uh, we went from there is that in 1926, which is somewhere in between Bohr and Chadwick, uh, we have uh, Erwin Schrodinger. Oh, and Schrodinger. Have you heard of the famous story of Schrodinger's cat? You heard that one? No. You haven't heard of Schrodinger's cat? No. Oh, I'll leave it for another day. No, but Schrodinger uh, did some maths, okay? He basically combined two physicists' idea. One of them is Max Planck, and I think uh, de Broglie as well. Um, he combined those two uh, physicists' ideas together. He also combined Einstein's ideas together. And he proposed that with some mathematics, it turns out that the electrons don't behave nice and neatly in orbits, unfortunately. We found that we can't really tell exactly where they are. We can't tell them exactly where they're going. So what's left is a mathematical calculation of where the electron probably is. Okay, so if you got a nucleus, he said, oh, well, it's somewhere in this space here for the first energy level. The next energy level, you'll find them somewhere around there and there and there and there. So eventually you get this really weird overlapping idea, three-dimensional shapes, okay, where obviously the more dense I've drawn it in, the more, the more probable you'll find the electrons in there. 
So it becomes a map of probability of where those electrons will be found. And this is called the quantum mechanical model, or quantum mechanics. You might have heard that before. So some people call it quantum model or quantum mechanical model. Question is, do you need to know this one for your test? Absolutely not. Uh, grade 11, uh, you know, students who take chemistry as a specialty subject, they will study this. Okay. The Bohr model combined with J James Chadwick's, you know, neutron, that is plenty good for 70, 80 percent of chemistry. All right. It it does very well for most for most things that you'll encounter. So definitely, all you need to know for grade uh, nine, all you need to know for grade 10, the Bohr model idea will do just fine. When you get to grade 11, you'll find the limits of the Bohr model. You can't really draw atoms much bigger than uh, cal uh, calcium on the list because that's where the Bohr model style starts to break down. And I'll show you what that means when we do some practice problems. But that's basically the video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it and catch you next time.